Let's pray. Amen. Once upon a time, <laughs> there was this woman, and she was extremely beautiful. Not only in her own sight, but all the people found her attractive. And she was so fixated about her appearance, she'd spend many happy hours looking at herself. And for this purpose, she commissioned a beautiful mirror. So she had this mirror and she'd spend all of her spare moments looking at this mirror, adoring herself. Now this story isn't about this woman. It's actually about the mirror. Now this mirror really began to love its job. It would be there all day long, standing in front of this beautiful woman, and it would spend many pleasurable hours looking at this woman because her face was reflected in it, and it really began to enjoy itself. And this happened for so long, this mirror began to have visions of self-delusion. This mirror actually began to think that it was beautiful because it reflected this beautiful woman. And she would not let anybody else use this mirror. It was only for her purposes. So there began to be this relationship between this mirror and this woman and this mirror began to think that itself was beautiful. So things carried on for a while, going from bad to worse, and this mirror began to think that it was more than it really was. Its purpose in life was just to reflect things, anything, but because this woman kept it for herself and all it would ever see would be this woman, it began to think it was so beautiful and pride began to develop in this mirror. This mirror thought, I'm special. I'm better than all the other mirrors in the world. And then one day, out of the blue, something happened. Without warning, someone grabbed hold of this mirror, and in fact it was this woman, and she began to handle it quite roughly and it thought what have I done wrong I've been behaving so nicely doing my job and I'm so beautiful and attractive and here I am being handled in this rough manner 
but it quickly got worse. So this woman, even though she roughly treated this mirror, she was still relatively gentle, but she handed this mirror over to the hands of this rough looking man. And this poor mirror didn't know what was happening to it. And it began to get worried. And then things got even worse. Because this mirror suddenly saw in the hand of this fierce and rough looking man a large hammer. And it thought, oh dear, that doesn't look good. Because it began to think, well, what's going to happen now? So, without a second thought, this man began to beat this mirror. And it began to pound it and pulp it into submission. Because this man was trying to take this pride out of this mirror that it developed constantly looking at this woman and it was an extremely painful and torturous if I can use that word experience for this mirror but it didn't last very long because this was this man was very experienced and not only did he use this hammer he used a fire as well to soften this mirror up so that it would become more submissive uh, quickly. So, cutting a long story short, this man began to beat and reshape this mirror into something else and it didn't know what was happening to it. After a short amount of time, this mirror, being beaten and moulded and shaped, was formed into something different. And it got formed into this large pot and what it noticed is that it wasn't alone because this mirror had friends and it saw that it was over here a part of this big pot and its friend was over here with it and they began to talk to one another thinking what's happened to our pleasant lifestyle that we had we had a joyful experience, <coughs> serving our mistresses, doing all of this beautiful work. And we were once attractive, and now look what's happened to us. We've been beaten up, brutally treated, abused, and now we're just this pot. <coughs> and then they sat there waiting to see what would happen. Then someone came and got a jug full of water and filled this pot up with water. And they were waiting in anticipation of what was going to happen. They thought maybe something good will happen out of all of this. Maybe we'll, we've been promoted in some way. And then they saw this husky man coming, dressed in some funny clothing. And they saw him take his shoes off, his sandals, and he began to wash his dirty feet in this pot. And they thought, what kind of a job is this? I used to be this beautiful mirror serving a really beautiful purpose and now this is what the end of my life has turned out to be. And this went on day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year and nothing ever changed about the job function of this mirror who got turned into a pot and all it ever did after that for the rest of its life was to wash the feet the dirty feet of these men <coughs> now you've probably realized that this is a story that's taken from the bible hopefully and it's a real story it's a story about a mirror of a woman who was willing to forsake her beauty and allow this mirror, which was an image of her, because every time she looked in this mirror, it was just reflection of her. So this was an image of somebody, and it got turned into this pot.
And we know what this pot is. This pot is the laver that's used to wash the feet and hands of the priests. So the reason why I told you this story is because some of us have a misconception about what sanctification is. And our perspective of sanctification sometimes I don't think is quite correct. And I think this story is, for me, a really nice, beautiful story about what sanctification is all about and what it looks like. There's this person here who's full of pride, selfishness and vanity. And the Lord's going to change the use of this person. And to do that, He's going to apply heat and pain to reshape and remould that person. And it doesn't take long for him to do that. In fact, it happens almost in the twinkling of an eye, relatively speaking. This person gets turned into this laver. And it sits there, unmoved, stationary, doing its job for the rest of its life. And it, has, it does nothing else except wash the feet and the hands of the priests. So when we think about sanctification, I want us to think about it in the context of this laver. It's a job function that it never envisaged it would do, this mirror. It's a lowly work. No one really appreciates it. It just gets filled with water, becomes dirty, gets emptied out, refilled. But it never changes its job function. It doesn't say, oh, one day I want to be a mirror. It doesn't scream out to the priest and say, oh, polish me up and have a look at me. No. Every day, for the rest of its life, it's going to stay as a laver doing its job. And so when we think about sanctification is a work, here's the work that it's doing for the rest of its life. And sanctification, when we talk about it being the work of a lifetime, is not some idea of improvement. Sanctification is being set apart from a foolish use to a holy use at the very beginning and maintaining that position for the rest of its serviceable life. So that was my little story and we're on page 20. We discussed Hosea chapter 10 verse 12. And I like Hosea 10:12. It deals with the Christian walk. It explains how this walk is supposed to work. In the verse itself, it doesn't explain how to put it on the line. So I've chosen to do that, not only myself, but all of us should really be doing that. When we come to Bible passages, we should be trying to see how these things work and how they fit upon a line. So, just so that we review what we did, we began in 1989 and we saw that we're going to plough. Then at 9-11, we're going to sow. And with that sowing, we saw that there was rain. And this rain was a rain of righteousness. And what a man sows, he shall reap. And so this rain of righteousness, when it comes in contact with the seed, we begin to have growth. And the only growth that you can get is the growth of righteousness. There's no other option except that. Then we come to the end and if this is the story of the priests, we'll think of the midnight, midnight cry. And then we get 
reaping during the harvest and we saw that the definition of reaping is to cut something short because there's this testing process that's going on and the Lord in his mercy cuts short the work of testing in righteousness he cuts it short for our benefit you know he doesn't want us to carry on being tested forever in a day because it doesn't serve any purpose once God's purpose has been served he'll stop the test but when we think about probationary time as some kind of get out of jail free card that we can carry on doing sin until the harvest or until something happens it's a wrong view of what's going on we saw what the ploughing was the ploughing was this field that is full of weeds and here's our tractor it's going to dig up and plough up this field and it's going to cut short the growth of all of these weeds and it's going to turn them over until you get to this stage here and here you have this beautiful field with all these nice furrows all ready for sowing a nice beautiful clean field and we're going to see that this field is actually a symbol or representation of a person's heart so this heart is all soiled dirty and damaged with all of these weeds and it's all cleaning up ready for the seeds of righteousness to be sown and then there's this growth ready for the harvest now most of us should be familiar and comfortable with this concept of conversion or salvation but what we may not be comfortable with is when we place this upon a line because as soon as you start doing that it then begins it begins to have implications I'm sure if I change this date here and said uh, this is the Sunday law everybody would, be, everybody would be saying Amen that's really good I like this message because this has pushed it all into the future so we've got plenty of time to get ready but the problem that we're facing is I'm putting this to an event that occurred 15 years ago and so it causes people consternation, causes people problems. I know many people have questions about, well, I didn't know anything then and I came in 2010 and what about me? Or actually I'm really new to this message and I've only been here for six months, what about me? And hopefully we're going to address that issue, but if you just uh, hold, that, hold that particular question in the back of your minds so that we can develop this thought because what I want us to see is not so much the intricacies about answering that issue but this process and how God is ordering the everlasting gospel in our generation that there's this work of preparation and this work of sowing, growth and reaping and we don't want to minimise the fact that it's this reign of righteousness that's causing this seed to grow So that's just a quick summary of what we spoke of yesterday and now we're at the bottom of page 20 and we're looking at Jeremiah and if you remember what I said yesterday what we want to do is look a little bit more about this issue here about this ploughing and, and uh, what, it, what it's dealing with I've already given you uh, an indication it's to do with the heart that these are, these are two different symbols of the same thing and we're going to discuss this a little bit more so in Jeremiah chapter 4 verses 3 and 4 when I have enough time in a series I normally try to um, lay a bit more preliminary information before I be presenting uh, the things that we're talking about say for instance Jeremiah chapter 4 now and what I'd try to spend some more time showing is that 
I have already alluded to this. When we speak about juxtapositioning, to give examples of how this would work, but we haven't had an opportunity to do that because just because of shortness of time. But we should be reasonably familiar with this. This is a another way to express this is to think about parallelism. Where you get two stories, two pieces of information, and you put them together. This is nothing more than line upon line. You know, we, we're familiar with, with this. Most of us are, even if we don't know how to do it, we're familiar that you say, at the end of the world it shall be like it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Lot. And we're extending that to say, as it was in the time of Moses, Christ, and the Millerites. So that's what we're talking about when we think of juxtaposition of parallelism. But you can extend this in many, many different ways. And in a singular verse, so here's verse 20, there's a statement that's made. There's a semicolon or a colon or a comma. And there's another statement that's made. And this happens in the hundreds of times. It's not a rare occurrence. It happens over and over again that we should really begin to be familiar with this, that this verse has this A-B relationship. And what you'll see is that it's a repeat and enlargement. So here's a statement that's made and it's going to be repeated. And that repeating can be either similar language or totally different language. But when you see this sequencing happening, then you can line up these two portions of the verse and we end up having 20 part A and 20 part B like this. Which is just the same thing that we do here. We, these are big reformatory lines. You can do it in verses. You can do it in chapters. It happens over and over again. This is a recurring theme in the scriptures. So in your notes, that's all I've done here. So I'm suggesting in Jeremiah chapter 4, <coughs> verses 3 and 4, they're actually parallel verses or verses that we can put in juxtaposition. Um, you'll notice, just so that before we go into it, I've divided the verses into certain sections and 4 verse 3 says part A, B, C. It's got three parts. And then verse 4 says part A, B, C and D. You'll notice that on verse 3, the first part which is verse A, I've um, put a line through those words and I've dropped, there's an arrow that drops it down to below C. So verse 3 is in the order of B, C, A. Hopefully you can see that in your notes. And then what I've done is I've lined those, that verse with verse 4. So I've got A, B and C and I've moved A down here like this. And then I'm connecting this to A, B, C, and D. This is verse 3, verse 4. So let's read verse 3. We'll read it in the order of the verse. For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground, and sow not among thorns. For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah... Oh, sorry, that's it, verse 3. I've read my own double reading there. So... Verse 3 is, used, is the same imagery as we read in Hosea 10, 12. It says to break up your fallow ground, which is what we read. It's almost, um, I think it's virtually word for word with Hosea 10, 12. Break up your fallow ground. Hosea 10, 12 says, break up your fallow ground. And then it says, sow not among thorns. Now you remember when we were looking at Hosea 10, that's what I'm saying is this imagery is being brought to view, that you have this field that needs to be ploughed and it says after it's been ploughed then you're supposed to sow seed. We all know that in you know the agricultural imagery that we're all familiar with but Jeremiah 4.3 says it specifically. It says you need to break up your fallow ground and the reason is because you're not supposed to sow among thorns. 
Now, in Hosea 10, 12, it doesn't mention thorns. It just says fallow ground. But when you, when you line that up with Jeremiah 4, 3, now it talks about these thorns. And there, there are thorns. And it says the reason you're supposed to break your ground up or to plough it is so that you don't sow seeds amongst them. Now, this is all the everlasting gospel. This is all the story of conversion and how we're supposed to get right with God. Now, I don't think it's difficult to understand what's being spoken of here, but it challenges your experience because I suspect there's many people, or there may be a few people, if you put it that way, even in this congregation, who are trying to sow seeds of righteousness while you've still got thorns in your heart because no one's ever told you any wise, any different. That's all you've ever been told. Most people do not understand the process of conversion. It's, it's not a rare thing. Many people have a misunderstanding of these things. But you can see the Bible is clear. And you know we haven't defi defined what thorns are, but we could. And it's not difficult to know that thorns are talking about sin. And you're not allowed to sow seeds of righteousness amongst sin. We could go to Romans chapter 6 and we would see the same thing repeated over and over again. This is a common theme in the scripture. It's not, uh, it's not something that's rare, that's, that's hard to find. But it challenges people's concept of how salvation works. Because we've not spent the time or been directed to these verses to look at them in this way. To really sit down and be challenged by them. So... Verse 3 is repeating Hosea 10, 12, which is what I said before, that we're supposed to break up this fallow ground before we sow the seeds because you can't sow seeds when there's thorns and thistles in your field. That's what verse 3 says. And now we're going to see what that means. Verse 4. It says, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem lest my fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. So you can see that I dropped part A of chapter 4 verse 3, this part A here, and I've tucked it down here because it's virtually saying the same thing as part C. It says, For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, verse 4 says, Ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. So you can see that they're talking about the same thing. But our focus is on part B and C of verse 3 and part A and B of verse 4. And I'm suggesting that these are parallel statements. So if you want to understand the definition of a fallow ground, when it says to break it up, it's going to define what it means in the next verse. It means to circumcise yourselves. And then the, the second part, it says, sow not among thorns. And that says... Take away the foreskins of your heart. So the imagery of verse 4 is now dealing with a heart and it's dealing with circumcision. But the imagery in verse 3 is talking about this agricultural setting. And they're both different images or different symbols of the same thing. So we all understand about circumcision. We all understand what it's dealing with but when Paul starts talking about circumcision and not, not just Paul because you can see Jeremiah understands the same concept is that here's this heart which is full of these noxious weeds and we could draw it like that but I always wonder how best to draw this because I'm not the best of artists. So I'm just going to put some black spot over here. This is this, this wheeze that's in his heart. But in the imagery of verse 4, it's not talking about that. It talks about the circumcision of the heart. So here's our heart and we need to circumcise the heart. And in this circumcision, we're going to cut a piece of this flesh away. And here's this piece that we're going to cut away. So here's this piece that was cut off. 
and this is the foreskin. This was the foreskin of the heart, and this is the circumcised heart. Now, all of this imagery, you know, we're Adventists, we understand what this is all referring back to. It's all referring back to the story of Abraham and circumcision and the sign of the covenant. But this foreskin that's being discussed here is, is these weeds that need to be cut out. Just like this plough with the sharp blade at the back of it is going to cut through all of these weeds, so there's going to be a knife that's going to come to this heart and cut away this foreskin. So this foreskin is the weeds or sin. Verse 3 calls it thorns. And here's this purified, clean heart which has been circumcised. It's this field that's ready to have the seeds sown in it. In it. And let's go to verse 21. Colossians 2.13 and Acts 7.51. And I'm suggesting that these are also parallel passages developing this thought that we've just spoken of. Um, Colossians 2.13 And you, being dead... In your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses. So Colossians 2.13 talks about being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. So we can see this is similar language to Jeremiah, similar language to Hosea, and it says that you were dead in sins before. So the sins that are being spoken of here are the thorns that we spoke of in Jeremiah 4.3. It's the foreskin in Jeremiah 4.4 and it's this fallow ground or the breaking up of the fallow ground of Hosea 10.12. So uh, this is just a little short Bible study to demonstrate that when I spoke about the ploughing that's being discussed here before the seed sowing, before the growth and the harvest, this is the time period to put away sin. By the time you get to this stage here, your heart has been circumcised. It took from here to here for this field to be ploughed. It's a large field, a small tractor. It takes time to go up and down this furrow to deal with this sin problem. The foreskin's been cut away and by the time you get here, this heart is now ready. And you, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Here is this uncircumcised flesh. So when it talks about flesh here, it's using the same imagery of your heart, of Jeremiah 4.3. Sometimes we've become confused when Paul talks about the flesh. Now he talks about the spirit and the flesh war against one another, and there's this struggle. And I've come across people who think that the flesh that's been spoken of by Paul in Colossians, in this particular case, uh, is something like your fingers, or your hands, or your ears, or your eyes. These are not the outward physical body that he's talking about. The flesh that he's talking about is this heart, and we've spoken about this, this is the lower powers. When Paul talks about the heart, he talks about the lower powers. Ellen White does develop this idea when she talks about the threefold nature of the, of the human being as being mental, moral and physical. There is a physical relationship between the heart, these lower powers, these passions and the human body through the five senses that come and give information to our being. But this flesh is, is something that's spiritual, it's not your fingers or your feet. I want us to, I want us to get that point clear. And then it says, hath he quickened together with him. Quickened means made alive, having forgiven you all your trespasses. So here are these trespasses, all of these sins that have been committed. And right here, everything has been forgiven. You've got a new clean start. You've been beaten and bashed. And now you've been formed. Because here you were this mirror that we spoke about in our little story. And now 
you're the laver. Set apart for holy use. Acts 7.51 Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. So if you see the parallelism, it's really easy to see in these two verses. Being dead in your, tr in your sins means to be stiff-necked. So you've heard the term many times used in the Bible. The definition of stiff-necked means to be someone who's dead in sin. And then this is the proof text that I just spoke to you about. When he talks about flesh, he says very clearly, your heart and your ears. Now, just in case you think that that ear is talking about your physical ear, it's not. Because in that, in that one phrase there, it says heart and ears. It's telling you that an ear is the same thing as a heart. Amen. A heart is an ear. That's why you can have ears and not hear. You can have a heart that's hardened against God. Amen. And that heart is not the pump in your chest. It's your emotions, your feelings. You can have emotions and feelings and lusts and appetites, but they're hardened against God. So if you want to think about it in the sense of love, everybody can love. But when it comes to the love of God, many, many people have hardened their hearts. So they have ears, but they're not able to hear. So, this isn't a comprehensive study, but hopefully it's a, we've, you've got enough information to be able to accept this premise between the ploughing, the sowing, the growth and the reaping and that this is the place to put sin away not in the growth period whenever I present something like this people often ask the question well what about my situation? I'm struggling with sin. I've got issues. Is there any hope for me? You know, because things don't seem to be working out in people's lives according to what I've just drawn on this board. And it becomes difficult for me to address those questions. And the reason why I find it difficult is because what we're now doing is we've moved away from the Word of God and we're now looking at the experience or the emotions or the thoughts and feelings of a human being and we're trying to explain the gospel from a perspective of someone who's got an experience which I don't think is a correct experience so I try to deflect this in the right way of expressing it but I try to avoid answering that question in the way it's framed because I think we should not be looking to our own experiences to explain the gospel to see how it works. We should set our own opinions to one side, see what the Word of God teaches. And if this is what the Word of God is teaching, just through these few verses, and there are many, many other verses that you could apply to this, and I think they would show the same thing, that this is correct. Even if you took, that, took out the numbers, the dates, if you see this sequence of events occurring, and your life is not in agreement or, out, or is out of step with this, then my request to you would be to get your life and put it into order put it into agreement with the Word of God Amen. and people say I've tried it before and it doesn't work I've tried it before I've tried putting sin away but it doesn't work and my response to that is what you need to understand is the true force of the will and that's a statement that many of us are familiar with. It comes from Steps to Christ. Most of us are not familiar with how to fight. Now, if you were going to join the army, no you know, self-respecting government would get some cadet, put a gun in his hand without any training, doesn't even know how to use it, and say, go and fight. Because people would just be slaughtered. And, and that's what's happening with many of us. We're just being slaughtered because we're, sent, we're being sent out to battle and we have no idea how to fight. Um, and it's a really difficult situation. Uh, this is not a criticism of the church, but 
there aren't many places that you can go to a conference church, uh, to a church setting, where you can be taught how to be saved. And, and part of the problem for that is, this is where you're supposed to be baptised, here. Amen. This is where baptism is supposed to be occurring, here. And many of us got baptised back down here. As my sister says, we get buried alive. Many, many of us have done that. And we may have, we may have recovered out of that situation, but we, we must realise that just because we recovered or we got introduced with some misconceptions about what the truth was and we're now walking with God, that this is an acceptable way to behave and it's not. God, God has a plan for us. He has a system which is really clear and we should all try and get our lives in order with his plan of salvation and not our plan and if it didn't quite work for you it doesn't mean we should perpetuate the problem Amos 9 let's turn to Amos 9 we're on page 21 so as you turn as we're turning to Amos 9 just want to summarize This is the story of the priests and this priest starts at 1989 because here he was in darkness. And here he's going to be judged. same reform line that we've drawn a few times now he begins to deal with the sin problem here doesn't have a clear recognize, uh, uh, concept of what exactly is going on but he, becomes under, he comes under conviction things are happening in his life he has some understanding of things and he begins to deal with the sin problem then here in 9-11 he begins to be sealed this is where the sealing begins We need to be really clear about this. The sealing is a process. It's something that takes time. It's a development. But this sealing is not a sin repent, sin repent experience. It's an experience of continual growth. A sequence of success after success, if we can put it that way. So there's this sealing. And after a sufficient amount of testing because this is probationary time then the Lord says there's enough tests that have been brought to this person where however many tests that was 200, 2000, 5000 you may get tested 20, 50, 100 times a day you multiply that by a year and now we're at 15, 16 years today and I don't know how far we've got to go so there are thousands of tests once these tests have, you've gone through enough testing, then you come to this period here, which is the third step, and now you'll be sealed. And the sealed bit is the conclusion of what was going on here. It's the end, it's the final part. And as you know, with this is the binding off. That's what the conclusion is. So that's a summary of the, the experience of a priest. And we're going to see that the experience of a Levite is identical. The experience of a Levite hour worker is identical. And we want to see how the relationship between these three groups works. How we dovetail those experiences together. Now, you've seen myself do this and many, many speakers have done this. So, if I go from 1989 to the close of probation, Sunday law, and I'll just put midnight cry, 9-11, and here's midnight. No, I'll, I'll just leave it like that. This is the priests, the Levites, and the 11th hour workers. 
You've probably seen lines like that drawn many, many times. And I've drawn that line here this week. When we looked at Second Chronicles, chapter 29, remember we did this and we said, uh, let me put that in scale. We said that this was eight days and eight days, if you remember. <coughs> Priests and the Levites. And then it said, after that, it was the ten tribes. Hopefully we remember that story. And then we went to Ezra. It spoke about the priests, the Levites, and the Nethanims. And we have all of these parallel stories that give us this structure. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this line as we've drawn it. And we're just going to fill in some of the details which have got to do with the ploughing, the seed sowing, the growth and the reaping and just develop this line in a bit more detail. And the reason we want to do that is so that we can really see the relationship of when things are going to happen for each of these groups of people. And Amos chapter 9 is going to help us to do that. Amos 9 verse 9. For lo, I will command and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations like as corn is sifted in a sieve. Yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, which say the evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. In that day, will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof and I will raise up his ruins and I will build it as in the days of old. So there's a lot in these three verses so we just want to go back and just make just a few comments on what's being brought to view here. Verse 9 For lo, I will command and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations as corn is sifted in a sieve yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. This is this sifting or this shaking that we've spoken about a few times now. And this sifting and shaking that's been spoken about, it says Israel is going to be scattered, or it says here, sift the house of Israel among all nations. They're going to be scattered into the world. This is a clear indication that Israel is going to be destroyed. It's going to come to its demise. And I'm suggesting that this is what's going to happen at the end of the world. We've explained uh, the reasoning or the methodology behind that. But in this process, it says, All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, which say that evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. So here we're talking about the purification of God's people, when we think of verses 9 and 10, this is the purification of God's people at the time of the end. And when it talks about all the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, I wonder what you think that means. Do you think that your military is going to come and shoot you or kill you or destroy you? How do you, how do you visualize this dying by the sword? Now, I'm not saying there's going to be carnage and destruction, but you know, when we think about the sword, we think about the sword of the Spirit, we think about the Word of God. And these sinners who are going to be dying is because the Word of God is going to be destroying them, because of their rejection of the Word of God. Like the Pharaoh. Sorry? Like the Pharaoh. Yes, exactly. It says, the evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. Now this evil is this coming punishment, this coming retribution that the Lord is going to bring upon his people. And remember we read a parallel passage to this in Isaiah chapter 28, I think verses 14 and 15, where it, talk, where it spoke about the scornful men who ruled Jerusalem. And it says, when the overwhelming scourge shall come, it shall not happen to us, because they've made a covenant and an agreement with death. And this is the same story that's being spoken here. It says, when the evil shall come, it shall not destroy us. In that day, this is the day of the Lord, 
will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof and I will raise up his ruins and I will build it as in the days of old. So verse 11 is now talking about the language that we've used before. It talks about the raising or the building, the construction of the tabernacle of David. Now this tabernacle of David is talking about the temple that David built. We know he built it through his son, but it really was David's temple. You know, we call it Solomon's temple, but it wasn't really Solomon's temple. Solomon did, uh, when you read the story, he did pretty, pr a pretty bad job in constructing that temple, in my opinion. If you look at the methodology that he used and the way he went about doing it, um, this was really David's project. David wanted to build the temple and we know the reasons why he wasn't able to do that. Solomon went, and went ahead and did it for, for him on his behalf. But when it talks here about the tabernacle of David, this is the construction of a temple. And we know that this construction of this temple is a construction of God's people. We've seen this as a recurring theme over and over again. John 2.20 we spoke about. We spoke about Millerite history, the 46 years from 1798 to 1844. We've spoken about it from the context of these two wives in the book of Esther. One's being married, one's being divorced at the very same time. There's this tension between these churches. One church is being brought down and one church is being raised up. So I want us to realise that when we speak about the tension, if I can put it that way, between this movement and the conference structure, it's all embedded in this issue of verse 11, where it says in that day, in this time period, the Lord is going to raise up the tabernacle of David. It's going to be fully erected and raised in that day. So, right here, the temple or the tabernacle of David will have been fully erected. But it takes some time for that to happen. And it takes from here to here for this temple to be constructed. Technically, it would be all the way back here. Because this is the 46 years that it takes to build a temple. It's not 46 years in our time period, but it is in Millerite history, it's exactly 46 years, because that 46 becomes a symbol. But the ceiling begins at 9-11, and that's when the construction of the temple really happens in earnest. If you like, to use the imagery that um, was used to actually build the temple, in this time period here, there's the, there's the cutting out of the stones, the preparation of all the material before you begin to build. So here's the preparation and here's the construction. Now, why does he want to build this temple? What's the purpose of the building of the temple? We would see quite clearly if the temple's been built here, who's left to go into the temple? It's these 11th hour workers. So these 11th hour workers are going to come into this temple. So at the, surf, at the level that we're looking at it, the construction of this temple is for these people to enter into. This temple is a symbolic place, remember, and it's composed of these stones here. So the priests and the Levites have built this temple, in fact they are the temple, and the purpose for that is so that once the temple has been constructed, these 11th hour workers can now enter into the temple. So you get all these three groups right here. This temple is a church. Uh, let me just put it here so that we understand this. This is the church triumphant. If you like the book of Esther, this is Esther. The church triumphant is Esther. 
But I've put the church triumphant as being built here. But we know that everything in the work of God is progressive. It begins with the priests, goes to the Levites, then the 11th hour workers. And you can show that this church triumphant will be complete in type here in the history of the priests. And so really the church triumphant is here. Here's the church triumphant, which is composed of the priests, and then the Levites are going to enter into this building. Once they've all entered in, then you have the church triumphant here, same church, and now the 11th hour workers are going to enter in. So we've got the church triumphant here, but technically it's here. Before we read Acts chapter 15, um, no, we'll probably we'll, we'll read Acts chapter 15 in our next presentation. I just want to quickly turn, uh, we're not even going to turn to the passages because it would take us far too long, but I wanted to see us to think a little bit about the book of Esther. you recall I've spoken about the various structures that help us to develop this line and we spoke about the 120 years of Noah and then the seven days when the animals are getting on the ark we spoke about the 12 disciples and the 70 disciples we spoke that it took 120 days to get from Babylon to Jerusalem and then they waited for 70 days when they arrived in Jerusalem to begin the festival services in the, tabern in the, in the temple on the 10th day of the 7th month. We've spoken about Elijah and the 7,000 who haven't bowed down the knee. We've spoken about the 12 disciples or 12 apostles and the 7 deacons. Over and over again you get these patterns. We've spoken about the two eight days of Second Chronicles. All of these structures help us to develop the line that we're speaking of. And so that we're clear on this, this is Midnight Cry, 9-11, Sunday Law. You can see that it can be an 8, sometimes it's a 12, sometimes it's a singular person. Now in the book of Esther, there's another pattern, which is 180 days and 7 days. We didn't spend time discussing this, but if you go to Luke chapter 1, you can get a period of 6 months and 3 months. There are many, many stories that have this structure and if you've done a quick calculation you'll realise that six months is 180 days. So this is the one that we're just focusing on here, Esther. So in the book of Esther, chapter 1 is a story that takes you from 9-11 to the midnight cry to the Sunday law and this is a story of Vashti. And Vashti is a woman, she's a queen, and she's married King Ahasuerus. So without taking any time to prove anything, this is the story of the SDA church. And if you read the story carefully, you'll see right here that there's a divorce. Now many people would sort of stand up in horror to think that the Lord is going to separate or to divorce himself from the SDA church, but he is going to do this. He's going to divorce himself from this church according to this story. Now Vashti that I said is the SDA church, let's draw another line. This is chapter 2. 
and we're covering the same history but this is the story of Esther and if this is a story of the SDA church who is this a story of? <coughs> because she marries the same person so this is the story also of the SDA church they're both the same story of the same church because symbols can have different meanings there are two symbols for the same church now Esther if you read through the story carefully she gets married here so you can see that there's something going on here where this man is actually married two women on the surface of it but it's only one church so he's still not broken any rules technically speaking now if this is the SDA church and this is the SDA church what are we trying to teach what is the point that we're making this is a phrase that Ellen White uses a number of times in her writings that this is the church militant and this is the church triumphant and once you can recognize that the story of Esther is basically if you just step back and look at this, the book of Esther is the story of the transition from the church militant to the church triumphant you begin to see a really beautiful story that's being developed that the Lord is trying to teach us now that would be a really nice story if that's all it did for us but because of all the additional information that's in that book all the different symbology all the little clues that you have and there are many many clues you can actually place this experience of a divorce and a marriage on a line and once you're able to do that then things begin to make sense about what's happening in your church life what's happening at the at your conference buildings at the general conference many many things begin to fit into place when you begin to take these stories and place them upon the line which is what we're supposed to do because prophecy was seen to be a, deline del uh, a delineation of events figuratively speaking that we can place on a line and as you see these things happening then you see that prophecy is being fulfilled so if this is correct and I want to suggest that it is here the marriage of the church triumphant occurs which is what we've got here church triumphant at midnight cry but this divorce for the church militant is going to occur all the way back here until Sunday law and so that we understand what the definition of the militant church is this is a church that's composed of wheat and tears and this is the church that's composed only of wheat again we don't have time to go through all the uh, Ellen White passages but she explains this in detail about what the definition of the church triumphant that there, are no, there will be no more sinners that enter into it um, and sinners are a symbol of tears so you know there are only wheat here and this militant church is composed of both wheat and tears and as we go through this line of priests and Levites and then into the 11th hour workers and we see that the church triumphant is here then all of these terms that you've probably read in the spirit of prophecy about the militant church, the triumphant church, the story of the book of Esther all of these things begin to fit into place when you place them on a line <laughs> it, re it really is that straightforward so what I'm suggesting is that once the priests have come to the third step here the conclusion 
of their history, which is right here. This is the third step. The conclusion, this is the binding off. Then all the tears here, all these tears that are in this movement, and there, there are tears amongst us in this room, are going to be sifted out, and it, we read it, they're going to be scattered into the world. And all that will be left will be wheat here. Because the two groups, the tares will be bound up for the fires of destruction, and the wheat will be bound for the heavenly garner. We read that statement earlier. So here's this wheat, and as soon as that has happened, then the Lord has a church triumphant. He has a triumphant church, and this triumphant church is Esther, but at the, it, at, at the very moment as this, as this has occurred, he's still got to deal with this church militant. He still has to deal with that. And he's going to transition from the militant church to the triumphant church in this portion of history between Midnight Cry and the Sunday Law when he starts dealing with the Levites. Because there are these Levites and there are wheat and tares in that group and they have to separate. And once that separation process has occurred, then these Levites are going to enter into this church, the faithful ones, the wheat from this group, and then you'll get the church triumphant here, into which the 11th hour workers will enter. And these 11th hour workers that are going to come, we use different terminology for them. And perhaps the, ni the nicest one to use is down found in Daniel 11 verse 41, Edom, Moab and the chief of the children are the first fruits of Ammon. Those people that come out of Babylon who join this movement or this church, this triumphant church. Let's close this prayer. Heavenly Father, as we consider the history in which we're living and the events that are occurring all around us, help us to have clarity of where we fit into these momentous events. Lord, each of us needs to understand the process of salvation, both individually and also how you're dealing with a church that is militant against you, a church that is composed of wheat and tares. Father, we know the separation process is painful. We know that friends, family, church members are going to be separated as you bring this sword upon the sinners in your church. Father, help each of us to examine our hearts and may we begin to put our lives into order so that we might become part of the church triumphant. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.